Hey everybody, I'm Chef Tom and welcome to my workbench. Today we're diving into the world of classic microprocessors, specifically the Intel 8085. This little chip released in 1976 was, I guess, a minor player in the early days of computing. But why are we looking at the 8085? Well, because when I was at VCF East, I stopped by the Glitchworks lab and picked up this guy. Glitchworks 8085 SBC Revision 4 Mini. Yeah, that's kind of a mouthful. Well, we're going to take a look at it today. Now, the 8085 wasn't the first kid on the block. It had a big brother, the 8080, and that had been around for a couple of years at this point. But the 8085 was kind of the leaner, meaner version of the 8080. It did most of what the 8080 could do, but it did it without the need of the minus 5 and plus 12 power rails. Here's the interesting part. The 8085 was released specifically to compete with another famous 8-bit chip, the Zilog Z80. The two processors were like cousins. They both shared similar design, they were both inspired by the 8080, and they could even run many of the same programs. But they weren't identical twins. The Z80 had a few extra features, making it a bit more powerful. And thus, it became the dominant chip of the time, seeing life in everything from the Sega Master System to the ZX Spectrum. So why do both exist? Well, Intel and Zilog were competitors. In fact, many of the engineers from Zilog had left Intel to go make the Z80 chip. And the tech world in the mid and late 70s was pretty much the Wild West. Companies were jockeying for position, doing whatever they could, and having a good, affordable microprocessor was the key. Intel offered the 8085 as a follow-up to the 8080 due to the fact that the Z80 only needed the plus 5 power rail, didn't need anything else. And the 8080 needed the plus 5, the plus 12, and the minus 5, thus making a system built around the 8080 significantly more expensive. In the end, the 8085 and the Z80 both found their places. The 8085 was much more recognizable in the tinkerer, hobbyist, uh, educational space, like people who wanted to learn basic programming. Uh, the Z80, with its a little bit more oomph and a little bit more processing power, found its way into early home computers and game systems. Now, to say the 8085 never made it into any home computers would be misleading. In fact, made it into one of my favorite computers of the era, the Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 100. This bad boy runs on an 8085, and this particular one has had the RAM upgrade, so it's effectively a Model 102, but that really is the only difference is the memory upgrade. And it runs the 8085 beautifully on a set of AA batteries. I could see why so many reporters and people who had to do work in the field absolutely loved it. This is the Glitchworks 8085 single board computer, revision 4. Uh, this is the complete kit. I picked this up at VCF East. Uh, 80 bucks out of my pocket, so you didn't give it to me to review or anything. This is a, a, a project that Glitchworks has worked on for a while, and I am very excited to get to finally take part in it. Get the collection of ICs, all of the passives that we're going to need. A little PAL sticker, that's cute. That'll end up on something, I'm sure. Some pin headers, sockets. Okay, so running around the board. Uh, 245, all four of these are uh, latches and bus transceivers. This is a GAL 22V10, so some customized logic. Um, it's going to be that guy. Um, 6256, these will be our RAM chips, two 32K chips for 64K of RAM. Uh, 39... 
SF040. This will be flash memory. Uh, so that will be our EEPROM with CPM built into it. The 8085 itself. Uh, 74 LS74 is flip flops. Uh, must have something to do with the glue logic. Reset switch. Power connector. And he calls this the serial mezzanine. Uh, when I saw his demo, he had a. Uh, it wasn't RS-232, but he had like a serial interface card on here that ran to USB. And if you have that, you can power this via USB as well. Who doesn't love a good soldering montage? So sit back and enjoy an entire afternoon and evening's worth of soldering crammed into just under two minutes. The RAM and all the logic chips are soldered directly into the board. GAL, the EEPROM, and the 8085 itself are not. While I was trying to straighten out the pins on the clock crystal to get it to sit more flush with the board, I um, broke one of them. I don't think that'll be a problem though. I don't know why people rave about these machine turned sockets. Give me a double wipe any day. And finally, the FTDI interface board. Unfortunately, the one I bought has the pins in the reverse order, so I had to mount it vertically. I have ordered another one, and we'll set it up properly when it gets here. All that's left is to plug it in and see what happens. To get it running, we hit the reset button, and it will launch into the Glitchworks machine monitor. Uh, if you're familiar with Wasmon or any other machine language monitor, basically the same thing. Uh, we are not interested in playing the monitor today. We want to get to doing something a little more fun. So I'm going to press B for boot and let it boot up into CPM 2.2. Now that we're into CPM 2.2, we're going to use the PC get program and send ourselves a file uh, over the serial port using X modem. That really makes me think of when my dad and I used to move files between our two computers in two separate rooms the same way, which was kind of crazy. Uh, we'd run a null modem cable like down the hall and we could send files back and forth. Uh, we'll upload this file and launch basic. This is MS basic. But as I was working on this program to do this demo, I ran into a lot of problems. Uh, this particular version of MS Basic 
uh, does not do well with extremely large numbers and Mandelbrot sets tend to deal with exponential numbers. And so I had to learn about an error trap in this version of basic. I've done everything in real time up to this point, but from here on out, uh, I'm going to have to speed it up. It just takes too long on its own. Twenty-eight minutes and eighteen seconds to run all of that. Um, not exactly a speed demon here, this eighty eighty-five. But the eagle-eyed among you may notice that I am actually running at eighty-nine hundred baud, not ninety-six hundred baud, uh, because I broke my clock crystal and I used a replacement from my drawers. I did not have a match to the six point one four megahertz crystal. Uh, the closest I had was a 5.767, and my only guess is the implementation for serial over the FTDI to USB uh, must be bit banging and tied to the clock. So um, I had to adjust my baud rate on the computer side to compensate. All right, that's a quick look at the uh, 8085 and the Glitchworks 8085 SBC Revision 4 Mini. I had a lot of fun building it. You can see here there's room for a expansion board and with that uh, you can use the glitch bus and uh, I'll probably be adding the compact flash adapter giving me an A drive to act like I have a floppy drive which will be really quite nice. Uh, if I can find like a really cool terminal uh, I may get the revision 3 board since there's a proper UART and uh, not the USB to FTDI uh, attachment that goes here. and. Uh, set that up somewhere down here maybe on the uh display station here for kind of a live hookup and see what we can really do with it and have some fun if you enjoyed this please give me a like and subscribe if you haven't already and uh thanks for watching i'll see you next time